Welcome to Baseball Biz on Deck. I am Mark Garbage, your host, and with me today, I have Miss Erin Carlson. She is the author of a great book of a topic I love, and that's all about the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, but specifically about the movie that brought the attention to a lot of folks about that league. The name of the book is No Crying in Baseball. Hey, Erin, how you doing today? I'm great. How are you? Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's a pleasure. I tell you, I mean, we were kind of chatting a little bit before the show about all the things as far as kids and the the league and ah, uh, there, there's <laughs> when you know. I got to tell you, you, well, one thing we let folks know again, it is the uh, No Crying in Baseball is the name of the book, but you're also author of a couple of other ones as well. Yes, I wrote. Two other books before No Crying in Baseball, and they are I'll Have What She's Having, you know, behind the scenes of the making of some of my favorite romantic comedies, including When Harry Met Sally. And then my second book is called Queen Meryl, and it's just a look at Meryl Streep's film career. And then my third is No Crying in Baseball, about the most popular baseball movie of all time, A League of Their Own. And I wanted to figure out why it was still the number one baseball movie. (laughs) It's more, you know, it made more money at the box office than Field of Dreams, which is one of the all-time greatest. Oh, yeah. Bull Durham, The Natural. And I was like, how did that happen? So I decided to write a book about it. And here I am. Well, that's interesting. I mean, the the appeal of it was actually the popularity. And, you know, here we are years later. I mean, there's been a... There was actually a very short-lived TV series. Then there was one put out by Netflix, which I think has been put on uh, Turnaround. <laughs> or back yeah, exactly. Right now. <laughs> but, exactly. Oh, gosh. I mean, the story is huge. And I can't wait to dig into this with you because I got to tell you my own personal prejudice. When I opened this book, I thought, okay, I'm going to get <laughs> some really neat stories about you know what happened in the filming. And there'll probably be some pictures in there. <laughs> And that was rather short-sighted of me because once I started getting into those first chapters, it's like, wow, she's captured my imagination. I said, I didn't go in this one and know all that much about Penny Marshall. But after the reading the first part of it, I thought, oh, my gosh, all this was what kind of part of her motivation. But understanding that director, understanding the person who brought this movie to life. So I, I thought you did a, a great job of, of doing that. I, I was astounded. I'm so glad you say that because, you know, I started out just writing a book about the movie, but the more I got to know about Penny Marshall and literally everyone I interviewed did an unsolicited impression of her Bronx Bronx accent. (laughs) (laughs) And I can do one too. I will not do it here, but they really brought her to life for me. And I just went down all these rabbit holes about her and I was, I started writing more about her and like the first three chapters are very penny focused Mm -hmm. i mean there's a lot of baseball throughout yeah it was her story she was the one that really pushed to make this movie i mean a lot of people wanted to make this movie but she pushed it over the finish line just because she was you know she grew up a tomboy in the bronx you know she was chasing boys like playing baseball getting some dirt in the skirt but because (laughs) But her mother was like, no, 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 no. You can't outrun the boys. Don't be an athlete. You are going to be a dancer like me. So her mom was this dance teacher. And so Penny just went into the performing arts. She played Laverne and Shirley. We all know Laverne. And then after that show ended, she got into directing because she figured that she would have a tough transition into acting in movies. Because everyone thought of her as this character from the sitcom. So she surprised everyone when she became an actually good director. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, because she's she was insecure and, you know, funny and extremely vulnerable person. And a lot of people wondered how a person like that could run a film set. But then she directed big with Tom Hanks and just blew everyone away. So by the time um, A League of Their Own came around, everyone, you know, wanted to work with her. A lot of (laughs) studio execs were like, I don't want to make this movie. Who's going to see this? This is about an obscure women's baseball league from the 40s and 50s. And girls don't play baseball anyway. What's the market for this? But Penny was like, no, no, no. 
this was going to be good. But it took a while to get it made just because casting was a bit of an issue. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I want to talk about that in a minute. And it's interesting when you talk about what was there before this movie and what you're talking about inside the book. It's, I mean, the only thing I could think of for years was like bad news bears. Okay. This is yeah. a woman in baseball. Okay. A young lady in baseball. Wow. Wouldn't it be something if a woman could actually play baseball? I, my mind, I did, I had either blinders on or just historically ignorant. It's probably a better way of putting it <laughs> about this whole league. And wow. I mean, Penny Marshall opened it up for me, you know, my, my, stimulated my imagination on it. And, and your book did as well. So much so that I've had actually a couple of the All Americans. On the show, uh, Lois Youngins and Sousa Pay, you know, so you're talking one of the Fort Wayne Daisies and the Peaches. Oh, yeah. My gosh, the stories they had to tell. They, they're they enthralling. They they caught me, and I had to do more with it. So right now, I'm actually helping out with the All-American. Excuse me. Let's try again. I never get this right. <laughs> it's a long. We talked about this. It is. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> oh, the All American Girls Professional Baseball League. If I hope I got that right, you did it. You did it. You did it. <laughs> All right, but I work with some of the ladies from that era who actually are trying to support women today, and they're going to have this classic in Sarasota with sixty women at it. But to me, you know, to me, that's fascinating. But again, go back to my ignorance. I mean, all I had was bad news bears. So with that movie, it really gave me an awakening. And I want to talk about that too, because Penny, she had this idea. And let's face it, a woman director? Come on. You know, we're not expecting to see a woman director out there. And this lady, as we were talking a little bit before about having, you know, the, the Bronx speech, if you will, and the <laughs> confident attitude. And, and to some degree, she, because of her own history and family, she had some instant crack open the door, but she had to open wide to actually get in there. T tell us a little bit more about how Penny uh, made those first steps into directing. She had looked after Laverne and Shirley ended, she had looked at the career of like Goldie Hawn who was able to effortlessly transition from film to the movies. And Penny was like, I don't think I'm that universally appealing um, where I could be a big star in the movies. So she's like, I'm going to be a director. Tur it turned out she was a very good director because she was thorough. She mm -hmm. rolled a lot of feet of film for a league of their own. She rolled like, I want to say somebody estimated more than 2 million feet of film mm -hmm. and it could wrap around Manhattan like three times. And at one point while filming a league of their own, they were like on the side of the road for one of the Rockford peaches bus scenes. And I think it was a scene where um, the bus driver leaves in a huff and like throws dirt in the chaperone's face. And it's like a big thing. Penny had reached a milestone that day and a Kodak truck showed up. Remember Kodak? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Remember film? And they <laughs> dropped off like buckets of champagne and all of this lobster because Penny had like broken some sort of record <laughs> for the amount of film. But she was like, she would exhaust people. Like uh, she was exasperating because she wanted a million takes, you know, of the same scene. You know, she wanted lots of coverage, which which means like you shoot the same scene from different angles. Right. She had three cameras on that field. This is before CGI, before special effects. Oh, yeah. You know, it was like it was a lot. At one point, she had Tom Hanks, who played Jimmy Dugan, the coach um, running the C camera, which shot scoreboard footage. Everyone wore a lot of different hats because this movie was as big as any war movie. The Rockford Peaches, the actresses who played them, thought of themselves as like um, props that talked, you know, <laughs> They're like they, they would sit in their trailers and they didn't know what they were going to be filming that day. So um, and they were filming a lot of like action scenes, little baseball vignettes like, oh, mm -hmm. catch this fly, slide into the space. And they didn't know how Penny was going to put it all together. Megan Cavanaugh, who played Marla Hooch, thought the movie was going straight to video. And a lot of people <laughs> did. Then when they saw the movie, they're like, oh, this is an actual movie. And they were surprised that it did so well, because what they remembered was sitting in their trailers and Penny kind of yelling through her microphone with her 
which amplified her Brock's accent <laughs> and no one could understand it. So Tom Hanks would translate Penny for people and he'd be like louder, faster, funnier because <laughs> he had worked with her on big. Oh yeah. And he just, they had that shorthand together, but she didn't have that so much with the Rockford peaches. They didn't have so much interaction with her as they normally might have on a smaller movie because the set was so big mm -hmm. and the, the budget was huge too. If this movie had flopped, which a lot of people thought it would, it would have been a huge cautionary tale for the entertainment industry. Like, nope, we're not going to be making baseball movies anymore, especially baseball movies about women. <laughs> so. I, I, I want to come back to that road of, of making it happen because, and especially when look at it, I can't imagine sitting in the front office looking at, oh my gosh, she's spending money on what? Yeah, And she, how many rows of film was this? Well, well Kodak's, Kodak went up how much more in the fourth quarter because of her? <laughs> Their stock's raising, you know, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, I, I wanted to ask you about those, the women, and as far as seeing themselves as talking props, that before they even probably what ran the first film or started recording, they had to practice on the field. And quite often they just did it gratis. There was, they were not being uh, paid to go out there and practice and learn the game. Is that accurate? Yeah, they didn't get paid until they got to set in Chicago, where the first part of the movie was filmed. The second half was in Indiana. So they were um, rehearsing and doing baseball drills for um, six weeks in L.A. at UCLA uh, with the coaches there. So they were not getting paid for that. And I wonder, I never got down to the bottom of that, but I was like, that's an injustice. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I know there's hard. so many. Oh, it was yeah. hard for them. Some of, some of them had um, real baseball talent. Yep. Uh, Rosie O'Donnell was an excellent ball player. Lori Petty had a solid windup, um, although she, you know, came from softball. And then Freddie Simpson, who played the beauty queen, Ellen Sue, was an excellent uh, multi-sport athlete from Kentucky. But uh, most of the rock for peaches were, as, as Penny called them, trainable. <laughs> it didn't matter how famous you were, because a lot of people, a lot of actresses in Hollywood wanted these parts because they were so rare. But Penny was like, I don't care who you are. If you can't play ball, you don't have the potential to play ball. You're not in my movie. So um, those were her stipulations. So um, Madonna, <laughs> Madonna could not, and the crew told me this, she could not hit, she could not throw, but she was trainable at least at the outset because she had trained with Joe Russo, uh, a coach based in the East Coast. And he mm -hmm. was like, you know, I think she's okay. And Penny was like, great. Let's cast her as all the way May because she had that star appeal, you know, the star wadded. She could get butts and seats. Oh, yeah. And of course, the studio was very excited because this was Madonna's heyday um, in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, the only person not excited about Madonna's casting as all the way May was Deborah Winger, who was originally cast as Dottie Hinson, the best player in the league. And, um, she left the movie because she was like, Penny, you're making an Elvis movie. You know, she thought that Madonna's presence would tarnish the quality of the film. Right. And Penny was just concerned about how the film would do at the box office. And she's like, no, no, no. No one tells me how to cast my movie. It's ridiculous to like, to like not want Madonna in this movie as a ball player. So they paid Deborah, three million dollars to go away, and they replaced her like days later with Gina Davis, who had no athletic ability, at least <laughs> according to the crew. And she had, uh, she, you know, I would say she had untapped athletic ability. She didn't know that she had that she discovered while she was playing this character and filming this role, but it, it was not really there at the outset, <laughs> but she was tall and she was an Oscar winner and she was gorgeous. 
and she had that steely game face. Oh, yeah. And she could make you believe she was the best player in the league. And that, my friends, is movie baseball, which is different than real baseball. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, she was dotty. I just couldn't imagine anything else. As going right? through... I mean, I'm reading right? your book, you see all these other people circulating around who may or may not be in certain roles. And then you see Gina Davis emerge and it's like, yes, I'm so glad that she was there. Uh, all those other people, I said, yeah, they could have done it, but it would not have been the movie that it was. And her ability to interact with people like Lori, Lori Petty with uh, being the, the kid sister kit, uh, that. I, I felt that all the way through. That just seemed so real to me. And and I, I sometimes, I don't know if you actually pull for a character sometimes in a movie, but you know, you pull for Dottie, but I found myself pulling for Lori's character as well. And it's like, uh, you know, yin, yin, yang, who, who, who do I really like in this movie? Who am I pulling for? But uh, both yeah. of them gave such a real performance. It's grabbed me. Lori, um, Lori would like to hear that because Lori has spent basically her whole life, her whole career, you know, hearing, oh man, Dottie lost the World Series to Kit. That you know, people thought Dottie dropped the ball yeah. on purpose during that home plate collision to help Kit win. And Lori told me, you know, people who think that have never had to scrape and climb up mountains and work for anything in their life. And I loved her spunk. Like that spunk, she really channeled into Kit and that insecurity. Uh, as well, because Lori was twenty, like 25, 26 at the time, mm -hmm. still young. Uh, she hadn't been seen in Point Break yet. You know, no one had seen her being awesome on that surfboard next to Keanu. So she was an unknown, but yet she was this like the second lead in the movie under Gina. So then she sees Jean Deborah leaves the movie. Lori's like, oh my God, I look like this woman. I'm going to get fired. And because Penny wasn't the best communicator, she never told Lori at the beginning, I'm not going to fire you, you know? So Lori <laughs> was just sitting there like, oh my God, Deborah left. So she met with Gina and they liked each other enough. I don't think that they're, um, I think they, there's a lot of professional respect there, but I don't think those are two people who would be friends in real life because they are so different, but that worked for their characters. You had Dottie Henson, the stoic athlete's athlete. And then you had Lori, the striving, um, the striving wannabe baseball star who's in her sister's shadow. Yeah. And that worked for them. There was an uneasy chemistry on set when they were in when they were in the same scene together. But when they were um, apart, they really, you know they really felt more comfortable or seemed more comfortable, but they're, um, they're friendly. And Lori thinks Gina is so sleek. And <laughs> um, in hindsight, she thinks Gina was just very shy on set because Gina was often, you know, in her trailer and kept to herself. Um, and she was older at least by 10 years than a lot of the other actresses on her team. Wow. Well, wow, I, I didn't realize that, uh, I'll just say one thing too about Gina. I think it was a series years ago called Buffalo Bill. And she was in that, uh, who was it? Dabney Coleman, her yeah. and, and some other ones. But we're not going to go down there. But I mean, she caught my attention then too. It's like, wow, this, this, it was a great show. But anyway, coming back to this, yeah, Kit, my goodness. Yeah, Kit to me was, was it. And, I'm sure some folks said, oh, she dropped the ball. But the the like you said, the spunk, the energy that Lori brought to that character, I think everybody felt that. It, and we were pulling for as much as we had to see separated. And we've been pulling for the beaches all the way through the film. You couldn't help but pull for Kit there at the end. At least I couldn't. <laughs> it's So I thought, I you know, know. It's, a, it's masterful, masterful. But let's let's go back to the business of bringing this game together. Penny met with some people from the All American Girls Professional Baseball League, and they, <laughs> well, you know, and you, you were probably kind of protective of who they were and sharing that information and how they were going to be represented. Was that something Penny had to to work together with on them, or was that much? Oh, of an yeah. So, um, so as you know, um, you know, as your listeners know, the league 
you know, ended in 1954 after an 11-year run, and then it faded into obscurity. Like, off the history books, you know, we just forgot about them. We never knew about them. In the early 80s, the alums started reuniting. You know, they would have, like, little conferences that just grew and grew and grew. And um, the media kind of smelling a hot human interest story. They're like, oh, you know, they started writing about these reunions. Then the son of one of the players, Helen Kandel, you know, she was um, called the Ted Williams of women's baseball. He made a documentary about her that was called A League of Their Own. And it aired on PBS nationally in 1988. Penny saw that and was like, oh, I have to make this movie. (laughs) But there were other producers. There were two other producers from Michigan. Um, I'm from the upper Midwest. So, um, you know, I really, these guys were great. (laughs) But they, you know, the the league was based, um, a lot of the alums and the league itself um, were based in the Midwest. So these guys forged... um, One of them is named Bill Pace. The production company now defunct is called Longbow Productions. And he really reached out to these women. He met these women. He gained their trust. And um, there was a suspicion around um, wanted the rights to the league and wanted their approval and permission, you know, to use their story for a feature film. So. Penny had this competition. So she goes to a reunion in Fort Wayne. I, I, oh, no, 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 no. This was Cooperstown. This was Cooperstown in 1988. And the women were receiving, they were um, there to commemorate um, a tribute to the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League <laughs> <laughs> at the Baseball Hall of Fame. And Penny went for the opening festivities and she was a chain smoker. So um, she was obviously the most famous person there, but she was drawing attention also for her smoking habit. And she would go into the gift shop and sneak a smoke. (laughs) And she um, was just trying to get to know the women individually and let them know I'm this direct I'm the celebrated director of Big and Awakenings, an Oscar nominated, but you know, film. I'm gonna do you justice. But these other guys, you know, had positioned themselves as, you know, um straightforward mm-hmm. mid- Midwestern types. And um, so she and they actually got Longbow Productions, they got the rights to the league. So Penny was just angry about that so angry but then she um forged a deal with longbow and they came on as co-producers and everyone was happy but she got the rights to the league through them (laughs) basically and that was a long that was a long answer i hope i haven't bored no no not at all i mean but but they were extreme oh at one point she tried to get into a banquet this was like a banquet held um, the night before the unveiling in Cooperstown, and she was kicked out. Oh, uh, the the uh, one of the um, board of directors of the All American Girls Professional Baseball League Association <laughs> was like, <laughs> was like Penny. I don't care who you are. You're taking a ticket that belongs to somebody's husband. You need to leave. So Penny went to like a steakhouse with Faye Dancer, who was a Fort Wayne Daisy, and Pepper Pear Davis, another former Fort Wayne Daisy. And they had a great time. Faye and Pepper were telling these hilarious stories. And they were instrumental in getting the rest of the league to accept Penny, ultimately. So she got her way in there. And I think it's a much better movie. I can't imagine another director making this movie and making it as good as it it was. You needed that perspective, that female perspective, but also that eye for comedy. 
And that ability to hire the best people for the job, uh, Babalu, Mandel, and Lowell Gans, they were di- hot, hot, hot screenwriters at the yeah. time. And they had written Parenthood and Splash. So they're the reason the movie is so funny. I mean, and the great performances by Tom Hanks and Megan Kavanaugh, you know, and so many, Rosie O'Donnell and Madonna and so many others. But Penny hired the best people. And uh, one of those peop- uh, people was Tom Hanks, who yeah. brought so much comedy. And then John Lovitz, who was just this great comic supporting man. <laughs> you know, one of the things you kind of set up all this early on in the book, because Penny Marshall had a house where several people came over, visited or stayed there. I mean, several actors and such, if I remember correctly. So she had almost a, an informal entourage, if you will, of, of actors and producers or whatever that she could just reach out to because they'd been buds and been working hard together. Oh, yeah. I mean, she had this giant Rolodex. Um and she just loved being at the center of social life. Um, she, her um, One of her best friends was Carrie Fisher. And they threw these like uh, joint birthday parties every October that were just like the hottest ticket in town, which seems so funny to me now because it was like, oh, Penny Marshall and Carrie Fisher. But yeah, people clamored to get into these parties. And um, Babalu Mandel, one of the writers for League of Their Own, told me that the parties scared him because there was some activity going on, Mm. maybe illegal. (laughs) So he would hide in the bushes. And I was like, oh, oh, that would be me. I that would be me. I'd be like, no, no, here's here's my ticket to this party. I'm I'm Midwestern. But um, it was really fun to hear about that. And yeah, she she could just call up uh, Robert De Niro, for instance, and say, hey, do you want to be in my movie Awakenings? And um, go over the studio's head. And the studio was like, did you just cast Robert De Niro, who she called Bobby D? And she was <laughs> like, yeah, why not? <laughs> I love it. Oh, my gosh. It, you know, you talk about. <laughs> <laughs> the, the connections and and who's invited to the party. I'm going to go back to what you were talking about earlier. And with Penny not being able to get into the party that she'd bought a ticket for, but going over mm-hmm. to the steakhouse with two other, other mm-hmm. ladies from the organization. And I think maybe that is what she got an in intimacy, if you will, with women there who would then, like you said, convey to the others, hey, this lady's on the mark. She's she's worth talking about. We we can trust her. So you, you see things like that happen. Her not actually getting into the group with everybody there may have been a beneficial thing for her, but with just meeting with those two women at the steakhouse who could yeah. introduce her as you know um, envoys of any, I guess, for, for lack of a better word. That's a great word for yes, envoys. Uh, <laughs> Oh, uh, diplomats. You know, we we talked a little before we got started today. There's just so many pairs of people to talk about in this. And one of them was the sisters. You were talking about the son of, uh, let's see, Marge and Helen. Uh, Yeah. Tell tell us a little bit about Marge and Helen. So Marge and Helen were sisters and they're from Vancouver. And they played on um, baseball leagues and softball leagues um, in the city. And they were... They were, um, uh, they came from a large Irish working class Catholic family. And baseball was just a way for them to get away from their city, um, travel, find new adventures, and make money, you know? <laughs> that always and get, get out of the factories and do something that they love. And oh my gosh, get paid for it. Just like a professional male athlete. So they joined the league in 1944. And they started out with the Minneapolis Millerettes. But that um, franchise was uh, disbanded early on because there were, it it was a saturated market. Um, There was a men's minor league. Uh, team in town so 
they ended up moving to Fort Wayne, Indiana, and played with the Daisies. Right. And Helen was um, Helen was younger than Marge, but she was a stronger hitter and just the the better athlete, better batting average. Um, Marge was no slouch. Mm-hmm. Um, she like set a batting record at one point, but she was always just in um, Helen's shadow. Again, there was newspaper coverage at the time calling Helen the Ted Williams of women's baseball. And Marge, you know, just struggled to keep up with her. Um, She was very beautiful. She looked the part of, I think, what Philip K. Wrigley, the chewing gum negative of Chicago, the founder of the league, she looked the part of what he wanted a uh, women's baseball player to look like in his in his estimation, you know, play like a man, look like a lady. And she looked like a film star. Right. Um, so she had and she was vivacious. Her personality was funny and outgoing, whereas Helen was more reserved. So there are elements from their dynamic that Kelly Kandal, who created that documentary about the league who then worked with Penny on a character and story outline. He gets a story by credit in the film. So um, he created these characters that the writers kind of took and did their own thing with, but their um, his, his character outline, you know, there are traces. uh, I wish I had it with me right now. (laughs) I mean, it is so good, but um, but his his uh, aunt and his mother had this sisterly rivalry that um, is the core of the tension of the film, ultimately. And that goes back all the way to Marge and Helen. So um, there was a moment. Um, if you go back and watch the Kelly Kandal's League of Their Own documentary, it's half an hour. The women are hilarious and feisty. And just larger than life. I mean, their personalities are just as big, if not bigger, than the Rockford Peaches in the fictional movie. (laughs) But at one point, um, Kelly is interviewing his mother and his aunt. And his aunt is sort of looking off, you know, in the distance. (laughs) Well, you know, and she seemed uncomfortable sitting next to Helen. And I don't think that part of me is like, what does that body language speak to their dynamic? Because Marge is sort of like being cut off here and yeah. Helen is fully in frame, you know, being interviewed by her adoring son. So <laughs> I I think they had a good relationship at the end, but I don't think it was as close you know, as it seemed, or as they once were back in the league's heyday. But yeah, um, Helen, according to Kelly, was Dottie, you know? <laughs> well, you, you, I tell you what, as you unfold that in your book, it becomes very clear. So, oh, is this, this is Kit and Dottie. I mean, even just with yeah. the first, before you get into much depth with what you're saying, it's like you introduce it well enough. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, that, just to see that these ladies became quite honestly, I guess the template before those characters. Mm-hmm. And yeah, uh, that's, that is amazing. And we're going to go stick with this whole theme of duets, if you will. And let's look at Penny Marshall and David Anspa. Um, my gosh, Penny has put all this work into putting this movie together. She's working on a movie of Awakenings with Robin Williams and Bob De Niro, Bobby D. <laughs> no big deal. No, no, nothing going on here. Don't look. But <laughs> it, it it comes to the point of where people, I guess, in the studio are real excited about getting this thing launched right now. The excitement's here. Let's go with it. And, oh, Penny, you're not available. Um, what are we going to do? So they they bring what? What's has it has to evolve from there? They bring David Anspaugh on because they wanted to make the movie right away. But she was filming Awakenings. 
So she stayed on as a producer and she was very sad. She's like, Gans and Mandel, why did you have to make the movie so good? They want to make it now. So, but as a producer, she understood why they would the why they would want to do that. So David Anspa, who directed that beloved basketball movie, Hoosiers, right. came aboard as a director. And um he, first of all, he's a really nice guy. He's super genuine and um just really funny. Like Gans and Mandel, the scriptwriters, did not think he was funny. <laughs> it's a different kind of he, funny. Right, right. I I thought I thought he was funny because he was so honest yeah. about his predicament. So he scouted the locations. He found Bossy Field in Evansville, which was the home of uh, the Racine Bells. He found those ballparks. He found the locations. He was... Um, you know, designing the uniforms, the tunics that the players wore and casting and casting people. He um, cast Rosie O'Donnell. You know, he was holding these giant auditions at UCLA and was the director. And then all of a sudden, you know, things got rocky. He was having a hard time casting Dottie. And, um, you know, he wanted this person. The studio wanted this person. Penny had wanted Demi Moore, but Demi Moore was off doing something else. And so there was a breakdown in communication. And um, meanwhile, he was taking out the in the drafts of the script that Babalu uh, Mandel and Lola Gans were writing. He was taking out their jokes. And they're comedians, they're comedian writers, you know. So they, you know, had seen a screen test of Helen Hunt. um, And I think she may have been testing for Kit or Dottie. But they were like, we don't know what happened here. This is not funny. Like, this is not working. And uh, they told Penny about this. And um, behind the scenes... You know, they were working on, you know, and the studio had a lot to do with this. The studio had a falling out with Anspa. Right. So he was replaced. Um, different forces wanted to replace him. And it broke his heart because he found out when he was in Indiana at another location scout. It totally broke his heart because he had seen the Fort Wayne Daisies play as a child growing up in the, in Indiana. He had directed Hoosiers, which is a classic sports movie that makes grown men cry. Yeah. <laughs> he had a different vision for what a league of their own should be. And his was um, more realistic. He told me, he's like, I don't want Rosie O'Donnell, you know, jumping into the stands and grabbing a hot dog in her mouth. And, you know, I see his point. You know, I do see his point there. I feel like there are different versions of this movie um, out there. But, you know, Penny thought, you know, I knew he would get the heart of the film. And that was the most important thing for her is the heart. But for Gans and Mandel, the humor, um, the humor was the priority. And Lowell Gans had worked with Penny on Laverne and Shirley and her loyalty was there but i think the movie also doesn't work without gans and mandel (laughs) oh gosh i mean that was the other couple i was going to mention gans and mandel and the the whole thing i I love that the rosie o'donnell bit that they had wrote and like you said ann spa was like oh that's that's not right ann spa was just the wrong wrong director for the script and people knew it I was gonna say he did yeah. great with Hoosiers, you know, and but it was a sensitive, serious, and while you still have a serious nature to you know, uh, a league of their own, I don't think it stays so, so serious all the time. You can't enjoy these little sharp moments that Gans and Mandel put in there, right? Exactly, and and some of the humor is slapstick, but I think it captures the there's like a newsreel and um, kind of manic quality. Yep, you know, it captures the era. It just, there's something about it that just captures the era. But Anspa did not see eye to eye. You know, I wonder if he had done the film. If he, if they had kept him, 
would he have kept the no crying in baseball scene? Because yeah. Gans and Mandel wrote that sitting across from each other freehand. And that's how they wrote. They wrote like Jerry Seinfeld and Larry David wrote Seinfeld, like sitting at, you know, desks, opposing desks and just shouting words into the air. <laughs> no crying in baseball, no crying in baseball. And they just wrote it down. Um, and it's it didn't really change from um, page to, you know, um, from page to screen. It was intact. And Tom Hanks took the bit and ran with it and just. Every time, I mean, every time I just crack up laughing. He's so brilliant in that. Oh, he he was. I mean, and I, I love it. I'm mean, glad you made so much. It was important that you made the title of the book. Um, oh, no brainer. <laughs> I was like, no, my editor's like, let's write this book about this movie. I love this movie. And I was like, I do too. Title, No Crying in Baseball. I mean, it just writes itself. It just writes itself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I mean, I had uh, who was Lois Youngins on here the other day, and she was playing as a player with Jimmy Fox as her manager, her coach. Oh my gosh! Yeah, and and she had a story or two to tell about the comparisons with Tom Hanks as a uh, Jimmy Dugan, and she said, "Well, he <laughs> never came and fallen down drunk." She was. We all knew he was an alcoholic, but he he kept that under. He was always polite. He always tipped his hat. And was quite the gentleman. And she said all the players kind of felt like that about him. But uh, he, he was something, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I know. That is, I mean, that is fascinating. I love that anecdote because the play, I mean, the, the original players, they um, pushed back on that Yeah, with Penny. They're like, you know, we think the movie is funny, but there are two things we don't really like about it. One is that. Jimmy Fox was much classier than he is portrayed, you know, by Tom Hanks as Jimmy Dugan. Um, and the second thing was there was a scene which Penny cut that um, had Jimmy um, kissing Dottie. Yeah. And they had this moment and he's like, you are you are like a natural ball player. You live and eat and you breathe baseball. You're the best player in the league. And she's like, yeah, I guess I am, which you never expect, Bo you know, Dottie to say. Because <laughs> her confidence was like, she, like, like, play it, don't say it, you know, mm -hmm. let, let myself speak for myself. But she was actually like, yeah, I guess I am pretty good. And so in the heat of the moment, he makes a pass at her. Penny showed that cut to the original players and they were like up in arms. That would never happen. Oh, my. Not in a million years. When Dottie's husband is off at war, like that, that kind of transgression would just never occur. Um, so Penny um, persuaded the studio to let her drop it. And they were like, why would you do that? There needs to be some sort of moment, some sort of romantic moment. And she was like, no, there doesn't. Because she was so, she cared so much about what the original players felt and believed. And she was a stickler for, even though there's a lot of hot dogs being, you know, grabbed in stands, you know, <laughs> she, she, she wanted um, kind of, she was always into realism, yeah. you know, and um, she wanted to stay true to um, the history of the league and the women who played it. And she was like, yeah, I have final cut studio and we're going to drop the scene. And Tom Hanks liked it. He liked it that there was that kind of tension in the air because they were work spouses, you know, and that worked better than actually following through on his desire. I know. Yeah. I was, a lot of times I see a movie and I see a consummation and I'm like, dude, I was, I was digging the tension so much. Why did, this is just, yeah, it's almost like letting the air out of the tire all of a sudden. I mean, it's, I, I, I've been here all this time enjoying this and yeah, that's a moment. Okay. I enjoy, but sometimes it just doesn't make sense. Sometimes the movie's elevated because of not, I'm not saying you don't ever bring the couple together, but if it doesn't seem right for that time period and the others, I think it was a great right. call, obviously. Right. And sometimes the studios or people in charge of them don't know what they're doing, <laughs> but, the, but the players did. They're like, no, <laughs> But they let the Jimmy Dugan stuff slide because Tom Hanks was so funny. 
Oh, <laughs> well, you, you're talking about all this in control. It's my mind runs completely to baseball all the time. So you have to forgive me. But all I keep thinking of is when a manager has to make a decision and the front office is giving them a grief about who they're going to play or whatever, or, or what happened just recently with the Cubs front office, they, they removed their manager yesterday and threw in another guy from Milwaukee, just like that. And it's like, what the, Hey, you know, it, it it's in baseball, right or wrong. Sometimes right. People are making decisions. Sometimes they aren't, but it's it can surprise everyone and you, you never know what the fallout's going to be like it's, so. it's brutal oh. it's brutal my heart goes out to the cubs fans i tell you that much right now it's just but, brutal oh yeah it, it is it is well I, I got a couple more for you and one again i want to stop and say you know we are talking to aaron carson the author of no crying in baseball and going over everything about you what you'd ever want to know with the, a league of their own movie so Let's see. A few other things I want to talk about was after the movie. Before we get there, there's a quote from Penny in your book that I wanted to go to. And it's on page 98 in the first inning. It is, as Penny assembled the peaches, she thought Tracy, she brought Tracy back to play Betty Spaghetti. She started to practice and would come home happy, Penny said. Quote, in a way, I saw in her what I wanted to capture in the movie empowerment and pride don't be ashamed of your talent i read that and i was like wow that that's you could feel that through the movie you can feel that through what those women wanted to achieve and did in that movie you can feel that i mean through the whole course of even the all-american girls professional baseball league so but you did a great job of, of helping us see that and so what's the next Thank step you. Oh, thank you. And and tell us about Gina Davis, because Gina Davis wanted to make sure that women had a, were going to appear more in the future movies. Didn't she create a commission or organization? Yeah, she has a nonprofit just aimed at um, leveling the playing field yeah. and um, getting more. Well, it all started when um, you know, she had a young daughter who's now, you know, grown up ish, but her daughter was watching like a kid's show and there were no little girls in it. And this is like 10 years after leaving their own hit theaters. And Gina was like, what is going on here? And meanwhile, they told her after Thelma and Louise that there would be more female buddy cop buddy cop oh my gosh i'm going straight to like beverly hills cop and like no <laughs> i know i'm like road movies buddy right. road movies and after a league of their own there would be more um girl sports movies um but that didn't happen no. so those movies were still con- considered outliers or flukes when something does well that stars women it's often considered a fluke for some reason and they don't make more of that thing so Gina was just angry and she wanted to do something about representation of women in Hollywood. So she started with kids programming and just worked with Nickelodeon and Disney. And as a result, there are actually more girl characters right. in the, right? Like, and it's kind of amazing. So she's still doing that. Um, meanwhile, she's found her, um, you know, athletic ability through a league of their own. And it taught her to be more comfortable with her body and with taking up space because she was so tall. She was always trying to slouch and make herself smaller, (laughs) but this like a league of their own proved to her that she could do it, you know? Um, So she got into archery and almost qualified for the Olympics. Oh, wow. (laughs) That's how good she was. Yes. Archery is a sport, Um, which I was like, Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's an Olympic sport. Oh yeah. But but yeah, she found um she found her athletic muscle through playing Dottie. And she was always drawn to playing characters who were more confident than she was in real life. And um she's her whole agenda in life is creating more roles like that for women that she got to play when she was younger and she wants to make a sequel to a league of their own 
which would be called a little league of their own, where Dottie, her character, would you know somehow come back and lead this challenge to you know to let a girl play on a little league you know a team in town. So she would play uh, that role, and I think the writers from Ted Lasso should write that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like they could do a sequel to that Little League of their own. <laughs> I think that would be funny and cute and there would be a lot of heart, but you have to make it funny. And um, if Gans and Mandela can't do it, then whoever wrote Ted Lasso should get behind that <laughs> and make it happen. <laughs> oh, oh well, I, I am so happy to see that, that Gina is doing that and it's having some success. And it's interesting. She came from the ground up and said, well, maybe we start with the children <laughs> and, and right. we get that started long enough. There maybe be some, some stars uh, in that element through Disney or what Nickelodeon and come up. So that's, a, yeah. but you know, the one thing that kind of saddened me, I mean, of course we, we Penny Marshall, we, we lost her and she, she was a great force and a, a great person to everything I can read and, and gave so much to us in cinema, but she actually was looking at, a story on Effa Manley, wasn't she? Yes. Um, and Effa Manley uh, was one of the owners of the Negro Leagues. And she's in the Baseball Hall of Fame and was extremely prominent. And um, toward the end of her life, Penny died in 2018 from complications due to diabetes. She had a um, pretty rough health history. Uh, she battled cancer and a brain tumor. Um, so there was a lot going on, but toward the end of her career, she was trying to get a biopic of Effa Manley off the ground. She couldn't get funding for it. Uh, a lot of her friends, you know, um, that had rallied, rallied around her earlier in her career we're not interested in funding the movie, helping her produce it, um, yeah. starring in it. So that was, a, a, and then her health kept uh, deteriorating. So the movie was just, that idea was just shelved. At the same time, she was working on a documentary about Dennis Rodman with full access to Dennis Rodman, because besides being a massive baseball fan, Penny was always courtside at an <laughs> NBA game. Hello. Like, yeah, huge Lakers fan and also um, 90s Chicago Bulls fan, as am I. <laughs> oh, I love it. You got to even enjoy the game, you know? Yeah. But so, so I, I, I think if Penny were still alive today, she would be like Scorsese, who's still making movies um, into his golden years. And it would just be... I feel like today would be a good sweet spot for her to make the movies that she yeah. kind of wants to make. Cause we need more of those movies, you know, more of these, those movies with heart and humor. You talk about people who attend the sports like she did. You look at uh, Spike Lee going to some of the games and you look at the Orioles, Joan Jett, you know, there there's all of these people who've been out there, but, we're not seeing anything actually come into the screen with this, whether it be F and Manly or what was the TV series a couple of years ago? Uh, pitch pitch. Yeah. Was, my gosh, I wanted more of that. You know, uh, a young uh, African-American pitcher and a uh, woman pitcher. And she was that the story was amazing and it just disappeared. And it's like, what? what? Yeah. People Powers like that show. Yeah, they really did. Powers of B wake up, you know, that's, <laughs> Oh, right. Oh, right. Oh. Oh. Okay. Okay. Here, here's a fun question. We'll kind of wrap things up here. Unless there's something. Is there something that you want to make sure we cover that we haven't thus far? I think. I think we're good. I love oh. that you asked me some questions that no one's asked me before. <laughs> I was well, like, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> like, did no one ever wants to talk about David Anspa? And I was like, I do. <laughs> I like David Anspa and I like Hoosiers. So thank you for asking about him. Well, sure. You know, I, I like that. I, I mean, the whole, when you write about that, you capture me again, because you bring up the whole Rosie O'Donnell piece with the hot dog, which was oh, right. a fun scene. And that while he was, you know, of a, a director of a different mindset than uh, Penny and, and Gans and Mandel, that, you know, that was, 
it was neat to see those kind of moments that you cover in the book. Again, I encourage everybody to read, read this. Here's the, the random crazy question. <laughs> All right. You're the casting director and we're going to remake a oh. league of their own. Who do you oh. have on your list for Dottie and Kit and maybe a couple others? Jimmy. Oh my gosh. This would, um, I feel like the older I get, I don't know. I don't know anybody younger than 35 anymore. Yeah. I, yeah. I wish, I hey. wish I knew. I would, okay. Who would I recast? Um, okay. Um, where, oh my gosh. I'm going to give you names because I didn't either. <laughs> okay. You can, you can have. This a, is so embarrassing for me. I was like. Do you, are you going to have Jessica? Well, Jessica Alba's not, we won't say. Oh, okay. Yeah, I like her. Um, yeah. Um, Zoe, is it Zoe Saldana? The, um, oh, that's good. Yeah, and, that's a good one. Let's see. Did I say Scarlett Johansson? I, I love her. I was going to say her. She could be all the way May. Oh, wouldn't she be perfect in that? She, and how, she is great. And how about Wonder Woman herself, Gal Gadot? You, where, oh, perfect. Could she be spe- uh, Betty She'd Spaghetti? She'd be Dottie. She'd be oh, Dottie. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's excellent casting. Um, <laughs> wait, see, you're better at this than I am. Oh, I make it up as I go along. <laughs> that's really good though, Gal Gadot. Oh, that that's like, you know, the new Gina Davis to me. Yep. Yeah. So so we got Gal Gadot as Dottie. Who we pick picking for a kit then? Um. So kiss. I'm trying to think. What have I? The only thing I this is not good casting, yeah, but the only young person I can think of right now is Taylor Swift. <laughs> hey, Were I had her written Taylor down. Swift? I had T Swift written down here. She was one of mine. Taylor it, Swift. Yeah, I mean, I could actually see her being the tall woman. I could see her on the mound. You know. <laughs> oh yeah, and then they and then um, they could put Travis Kelsey in there, like as an extra. <laughs> I mean, hey, it's going to be an Elvis movie. It's going to be an Elvis movie, Deborah Winger. You might as well just cast Taylor Swift because you uh, cast Madonna. Okay, let's do this. Yeah, I, li- but, I like. To- Go ahead. But not Madonna. But but Scar Jo as All the Way May because yeah. Taylor, you got to give her a bigger part. Yeah. So you got to give her that Lori Petty part. I think. <laughs> Oh, I love it. You got to have fun. Right. You, you've been great today, kiddo. Thanks so much for joining us here on Baseball Biz on Deck. Oh, geez. I could talk to you for another couple of hours, but because the book's fantastic. And people, if you don't know it, you need to. It's again, we're talking to Aaron Carlson. The book is No Crying in Baseball, the inside story of a league of their own, big stars, dugout drama, and a home run for Hollywood. Thank you, Aaron, so much for coming on the show today. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. I want to thank you all again for joining us here today on Baseball Biz on Deck. We've been talking again with Aaron Carlson, the author of No Crying in Baseball, the inside story of a league of their own. Big stars, dugout drama, and a home run for Hollywood. It's a great interview. Loved having her here and hope we can talk with her again in the near future. I want to remind everybody, too, as far as the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, that uh, kind of is the essence of the whole league of their own. There's going to be a classic a series of games in Sarasota with the teams with the original names, Peaches, Comets, I think Blue Sox, and who's the other one? Daisies. They're all going to be there. 60 women from across the U.S. and Canada, and I believe other parts as well. So looking forward to attending that. I'll put a link to that also at the end of this. And, of course, there will be a link to where you can purchase Aaron's book on Amazon. You can find Baseball Biz on Deck. Just put us up there in Google. You can go to BaseballBizOnDeck.com. You can go to Spotify. You go to Apple Podcasts. We're everywhere. Well, again, thanks for coming on, and we look forward to talking with you all again real soon. Special thanks to X-Take RUX for the music rocking forward. There's no crying in baseball! No crying!